Welcome. Today we will be talking about tearing, which is a complaint that you always hear from your patients aside from blurring of vision. It's a very, very common complaint. People will be telling you that uh, they're tearing or their, uh, their eyes are always wet. And it's a very, very common symptom of ocular and systemic diseases. So <clears throat> it requires a thorough understanding of the anatomy of the lacrimal system. And you, I need to emphasize that you need to memorize the lacrimal system. We need to be able to get to terms regarding what the terms mean. Like for example, lacrimation uh, would mean an excess in the production of tears. And epiphora would mean an overflow of tears. So lacrimation would be due to uh, too much production. And epiphora usually is because the, uh, the patient's uh, tears are blocked. You could discriminate between these two terms by asking the patient if their eyes are always wet or if their tears are so much that it's already flowing on their cheeks. So uh, if the, in that case, it would be epiphora. Let's talk about anatomy and how it applies to our problems when it comes to tearing. So this is how the basic um, lacrimal system looks so all the way from the lacrimal gland on your left and the <clears throat> on your right you you will see from the punctum to the ampulla to the canaliculus going into the common canaliculus into the lacrimal sac and down to the nasolacrimal duct and into the inferior meatus which drains through your nose. This is one of the reasons why when you cry, your nose also cries. Okay, so the exit is at the inferior meatus, which is covered by the inferior concha. We'll talk more about that later. So <clears throat> we could separate the parts of the lacrimal system into the production, which involves the lacrimal gland, but not just the lacrimal gland, also, the conjunctiva, the eyelids, would contribute to the tears later. And the drainage system, which is composed of the, the punctum all the way to the inferior uh, meatus of the nasolacrimal duct. There's a common denominator between the production and the drainage, which is tears. So, Tears is what is created and tears is what is drained. And that is one of the problems where uh, when the patient complains about tearing, it's either they have too much tears or they uh, it's not draining. So let's focus on the lacrimal gland, which creates your tears. It's an exocrine gland and it's divided into two parts. It's not just one blob of gland. It's divided into the orbital and the uh, palpebral lobes by the Wittnall's ligament, or what we call the superior transverse ligament. It has 8 to 12 major lacrimal ducts, which drains into the superior fornix. But the orbital and the palpebral lobes also have connections to each other. They are not basically um, totally separated. They have tubes they have ducts connecting each other. And if you destroy the palpebral lobe of the lacrimal gland, there is going to be a massive decrease in the amount of tears produced. It's enervated by the lacrimal nerve, which is part of the fifth cranial nerve. So if you have problems with the fifth, fifth cranial nerve, it got transected or it got... Uh, uh, involved in an aneurysm or in, in any pathology, then you would have dry eyes because your main lacrimal gland would not be secreting. And the secretion is divided into two. You have the basal, low-level um, secretion and the reflex sec secretion. Now, this causes a lot of problems as far as the patients are concerned because 
when you tell the patient you have dry eyes, they're usually counter with, how come I have dry eyes when my problem is I have too much, uh, too much tears? In fact, I have wet eyes, not really dry eyes. So they forget that uh, your eyes are supposed to have a very small amount of tears produced constantly. We call that the basal secretion. That means the eyes need to be always uh, moist, always uh, lubricated by, the, by, your, by your tears. And the reflex uh, secretion is the, f um, the tears that is held in reserve and usually just released when there is a problem like when you are crying or when you got dust in your eye or your, uh, somebody poked you in the eye. So it's a reflex secretion. It comes out only because there is, a, there is a problem. And what patients usually don't realize is the reason that they are, their eyes are actually tearing up a lot is because their eyes are dry. So it's an irony that some patients um, have a problem trying, uh, to, trying to grasp. And it's your job to explain it to the patient that even though their eyes are actually overflowing with tears their problem is really dry eyes so the tears would flow from the lacrimal gland across the globe across the cornea across your conjunctiva and into the drainage area but <clears throat> your tears are not just simple liquid it's not just water flowing from one side to the other it's actually a very very complicated fluid you have the mucin layer which is produced by the goblet cells of the conjunctiva and you have the main and accessory lacrimal glands producing the aqueous layer remember the uh, accessory lacrimal glands cross in wolf ring and you have the meibomian glands producing the oil or the lipid layer so you're Tear film is basically a, a complicated fluid with mucin at the bottom trying to hold on to the cornea. And you have the aqueous layer which holds most of the liquids, most of the um, nutrition, most of the oxygen, and most of the components of your tears. And you have an outer lipid layer which is protecting the tears from evaporating too fast. If you block your meibomian glands, then you would have a decrease in the lipid layer and your tears would actually evaporate very, very fast. But how does it get from the lacrimal gland to the drainage area? So how does it know where to go? It's just liquid. So how does it know? It's, uh, it, it is driven there by a process called the lacrimal pump. Now, the lacrimal pump is a uh, is a, an intrinsic component of your uh, of your tear flow, such that it is powered by the main muscle of your eyelids, the orbicularis, which is the muscle that is um, tasked with closing your eyes. Now, the orbicularis produces the motor power for the lacrimal pump, so it's the energy, it's the pump. And the contraction of this muscle will push the tears from the sac. Again, we're starting from the back, from the sac to the nose. So a contraction of the orbicularis muscle empties your tear sac by pushing the fluids into the nose. And when the eyelids open, the, the, uh, the lacrimal sac, which is now empty, creates a vacuum suddenly it's open it's being pulled open and it creates a vacuum and when the eyelids are now fully opened the puncta the very end uh, of the uh, of your oh sorry the very beginning of your lacrimal uh, system becomes open so fluid from your tears suddenly is sucked into the punctum into the ampulla, the caniliculi, the common caniliculus, and the lacrimal sac. And it will be pushed over and over again uh, every time you blink. So your blink is very, very important. So it enters the punctum 
for it to be drained. So the punctum is actually very important because it's the opening of the drainage. If your tears cannot find its way to the punctum, then your drainage will not work. You will have an overflow of tears. So the punctum, uh, you have both, the superior and the inferior, and the punctum is positioned against the eyeball. And it dips into the tear lake. Now, your punctum um, cannot be seen with if you just look into, uh, at your patient without touching the patient. So in primary position, it's it cannot be seen because it's um, uh, it's placed against the eyeball. Okay, if it's against the eyeball, but your tear lake is too too low, then it will not be able to drain it. So once it enters the, the punctum, it gets drawn into the ampulla and into the inferior canaliculus and superior canaliculus. Okay, so you have both. You have one at top and one at the bottom. The canaliculi is about 8 to 12 millimeters long. So it's a very long uh, uh, duct. And 90% of, of your patients, you will have a common canaliculus. 10% of these patients the canaliculi will enter separately into the lacrimal sac. But about 90% of them, they will combine into a canaliculus. So, <clears throat> from there, it will enter the lacrimal sac. And the lacrimal sac has a small valve, uh, the valve of Ro Rosenmuller. So, basically, it's a fold of mucosa that prevents the reflux of the tears that have already entered the lacrimal sac so it doesn't go out into back into your eye. Now, there has been some research questioning the existence of the valve of Rosenmuller because it seems that they cannot find a consistent fold of mucosa in every patient. What they found is that the canaliculus or the common canaliculi are entering the uh, the lacrimal sac at an angle. So when the lacrimal sac is full, uh, full of either um, tears or by inflammation, it distends the sac and it kinks the canaliculus. Okay, so the lacrimal sac is approximately 10 millimeters and it distends when inflamed. It's actually one of the useful uh, features of the lacrimal sac that guides you, that tells you when uh, you have an inflammation in the lacrimal sac because it's very um, it's very well protected by the body. Only the tip of the lacrimal sac can actually be seen. But when it's in, uh, distended, the entire area actually um, goes up. It, there, you can see a bump in that area. And from the sac, it goes into the nasolacrimal duct, which is about 12 millimeters long. It opens under the nose, uh, in the nose, in the inferior turbinate, and the, uh, that opening is about 2.5 centimeters from the tip of your nose. Uh, sorry, the tip of your nostrils. So it, if you follow it about that long, and you look be, uh, in the inferior turbinate, which is in, uh, covered by the concha, then you will find that small dot, a small hole where the tears drain. But at the end of this uh, uh, of this duct, there's a valve, a small fold of mucosa that prevents fluid from going up the nose and into your eyes. However, when it's swollen, that area when that area is swollen, there uh, that valve the valve of Hastner could become incompetent. And infection from your nose could go way up into the nostrils and way into the lacrimal sac and into the eye. So uh, a lot of times, if you have a nasal pathology, especially if it's an infectious one, there is a high possibility that it will reach your eyes. Okay, so that's the valve of Hasner. Also, in congenital um, conditions of nasal lacrimal duct uh, obstruction, the valve of Hasner is the one that's responsible, practically about uh, 9 out of 10. 
um, that means it did not separate. There's still a membrane uh, there. And you have an option of either uh, doing surgery, but usually we just wait until uh, uh, for in about a year, when the child is about a year old, because the valve, uh, that area would usually become patent on its own. So again, memorize this. This is very, very important whenever you're dealing with the patient with tearing, patient complaining of uh, very, very wet eyes or their, eye, uh, their tears are always flowing down their cheeks. This is what flashes into your mind. You're now trying to find out where the problem is, which part became problematic because only then would you be able to solve the problem. So how do you assess a patient who's tearing? Okay, <clears throat> we need to understand the factors that uh, control the amount of tears in your eyes. One is production from the glands. Um, usually you have the, the main glands and the accessory glands and you have uh, a basal secretion, but the reflex secretion is usually the reason why your patients would have complaints about tearing. So you could, it's usually because of the ocular irritation or problems in your, in your eye, the eyeball, the conjunctiva, or swelling in your, uh, anywhere in that area, which triggers a secondary hypersecretion. Your, your, your body detects a problem there and it's trying to relieve the irritation. It's trying to relieve the problem by flooding it with tears, hoping that the excess tears will wash away the problem or soothe any injuries. However, if the problem doesn't, uh, doesn't go away, then your patient really be, uh, suffers. They usually will not go blind, but they will be very, very irritated. Now, evaporation um, is about 10% in, uh, in children and about 20% in adults. It's higher if you have a problem with your lipid layer. It's also higher if your patient doesn't blink. Um, you see that a lot in patients who are immersed in computer use or reading a lot because reading and computer use decreases your blink rate. Usually, it's about 15 per minute. But if you're a very heavy computer user or if you're uh, focused with your eyes, usually it will decrease to as low as 2 to 3 per minute. And then you can think of the drainage. Uh, usually it's a problem with obstruction or an eyelid punctal malposition, an eyelid or punctal malposition. So that means either the eyelid is not touching the eye. Uh, it's too far away from the globe or the punctum is too far away from the globe that it's not uh, pulling in the tears. So a very lax eyelid will also decrease or compromise your lacrimal pump. Now primary idiopathic hypersecretion is very rare. These are patients wherein the problem is they have no problem except that their uh, glands, their lacrimal glands are overproducing the uh, the tears so there is no problem except the overproduction of the tears now that is very rare fortunately that's very rare because there's actually very little you can do in cases like that so let's talk about how you talk to the patients to get into the things uh, into solving their problem first you need to become an investigator ask about the onset and duration of their tearing. If it's been present since infancy, then you probably are dealing with the congenital obstruction. Most of the time, as I told uh, told you earlier, it's the valve of Hasner. If, if something else, then you probably will need surgery, but sometimes waiting for a year or uh, for, the, for the patient to actually outgrow the problem because the valve usually... Uh, becomes patent even without intervention. Does the tearing worsen when you are in low humidity areas? Now, what's a low humidity area? Usually, it's in areas where in the, uh, the, the, the air is very dry or in areas that are very heavily air-conditioned. Because of our lifestyle, a lot of places, both for work and home, are now heavily using 
air conditions and it dries the uh, the air so in that case you may be dealing with dry eye and as i said earlier when you're reading too much too much computer there's less blinking from 15 to roughly 2 to 3 and there is an increase in evaporation because they are not blinking as much and be, uh, be warned that problems in tearing are more common the older your patient are and in women. Now, you also need to ask for history of trauma. Now, you try to rule out any foreign bodies or corneal injuries, especially if the patient is a worker, a metal worker, a carpenter, and um, usually they can tell you, uh, I suddenly had this pain or this problem, this tearing, when I was working, uh, whether with metals, with grinders, with uh, drills, usually with heavy equipments uh, and, power, and power tools. Now, this is triggered by the reflex tearing, by your eyes trying to flush out the problem or trying to uh, relieve the irritation. Also, ask for fractures or lacerations. It may involve the gland especially if the upper temporal side of your uh, eyelids was involved or the drainage area they could uh, the um, the canaliculus could have been severed the punctum could have been hit so and um, things like this would actually involve a disruption of the system and because you memorized the anatomy it's easier for you to rule out which parts may or may be at risk of injury you also need to ask for associated ocular symptoms it will help you narrow down the problem ask for discharge redness eye pain blurring of vision foreign body sensation itchiness and exposure to another person with red eyes now the first three are usually involved with inflammation so it could be an infection it could be an irritation you could be dealing with an antigen you could be dealing with an infection and foreign body sensation would appear even though there is no foreign body in the eye could be because of tearing uh, because of sorry because of dryness or because uh, of an irritation that caused a roughening of the area of the eye especially your, the eyes are more sensitive to problems in the cornea. Please, please ask for consults with other doctors, medications, and surgery. Usually, people uh, try to avoid this because they didn't want to sound petty or they, they were trying to avoid ethical problems. However, this will give you a clue if the problem is already chronic especially if they tell you they've been seeing other doctors in other pla uh, in other places in other provinces and they've been given me medications drops or interventions have been done it might tell you that this problem has been going on for decades or just a few weeks and one problem is the tearing could also become be, uh, be due to the reaction of your patient to the medications that were given or to surgery that was done for example given a medication for glaucoma but they're using non -preser uh, preservative uh, full uh, eye drops now the preservatives usually are very irritating uh, especially if they're using benzalkonium chloride the higher the uh, the higher the preservative content of the eye drops the more irritating it will become to the patient's eye or surgery could have been done that disrupted the um, the smoothness of your patient's eyeball causing problems i uh, could the, the dryness could be focal the dryness could be general and ask if the patient have noticed blood in the tears some patients will only tell you this if you ask for it one because they probably got scared and were suppressing the uh, the idea or uh, is in denial because blood and tears may be a sign of malignancy uh, along with uh, patients complaining of pain in the, the uh, nasolacrimal area especially if you don't see any inflammation we've seen patients 
with um, bulges growing in that area but totally uh, no signs of redness no signs of swelling only pain and sometimes blood in the tears it's a sign of malignancy if you're uh, if you uh, if you're not comfortable uh, dealing with uh, cases like this you need to refer them ASAP also ask for other medical problems especially allergies and sinus diseases the sinuses are practically around your eyeball there's uh, there are sinuses on top at the bottom and both sides of each eyeball so any sinus diseases could trigger problems in your eye and if your patient have problems with allergy because problems with allergy usually usually causes a lot of tearing now after talking with your patient and trying to narrow down the problems it's time to examine the patient and basically you need to do a thorough gross examination this is one of those areas of the eye where you could examine the patient even without special equipments now try to look for eyelid malpositions and malrotations does the eyelid look normal is it flat against the eye is it um um is it showing you problems um for example lid retraction the eye the eyelids cannot close or the eyelids are too high it would um give the patient problems in the evaporation because the eyelids don't really close so the eye uh, the tears would evaporate very fast and since the eyelid doesn't close your lacrimal pump will also be compromised if your patient also has ectropion meaning the eyelids are actually uh, away from the from the globe it's the eyelid itself is not touching the globe and sometimes it's showing you the mucosal side also patient would have the same problems too much evaporation of your tears and compromise of your lacrimal uh, lacrimal pump entropion and um, <clears throat> eyelash uh, abnormalities usually irritate the eye because the in entropion the eyelids are twisted inwards and the lashes will now be scratching the eye now aside from the mechanical irritation from the eyelids scratching your eye the lacrimal pump would also be compromised because your eyelid is no longer touching your eyes the punctum might not be in the lac uh, and the tear lake and if you have an eyelash abnormality trichiasis this trichiasis it would trigger reflex tearing now it's very easy to treat cases of trichiasis in this trichiasis but we'll talk about that later now try to look at the um, uh, the eyelids do you have see do you see any injuries there is the cornea normal do you see any injuries and is the conjunctiva normal do you see any injuries whatsoever now remember these areas the cornea the conjunctiva when they get injured your eye becomes congested uh, your eye your blood vessels usually congest sometimes locally sometimes on a general area but problems like this will trigger a reflex tearing and depending on when uh, where the areas uh, are affected it could have an impaired drainage especially if the punctum is no longer touching the conjunct uh, the the tear lake if it's no longer against the eyeball now we were we kept on talking about the punct uh, the punctum now also look at the punctum are there abnormalities because if the punctum doesn't work then tears cannot get into the drainage area it's very much like your drain having something on uh, your your sink the drain of your sink having something on top of the the the, the hole for example uh, a plate but in cases like this try to check the punctum you need to pull the lower lids out for you to be able to see the punctum because the orifice the opening of the punctum should not be visible when your eyes are in primary position when they're resting when you're looking at them you should not be able to see the punctum sorry the orifice of the punctum but you may be able to see the punctum but not the orifice now look at the um, the punctum can you see it 
if you can't see it, then it could be punctalatricia. That means there is no visible punctum. And look at the punctum, uh, the, the orifice of the punctum. If it's less than 0.2 millimeters, then it's a stenosed punctum. It's too small. Flu uh, <clears throat> it may be functioning, but the fluids, the tears, doesn't get access inside of the, uh, uh, of the drainage system. Or is the punctum actually away from the conjunctiva, away from the eyeball? And in that case, it's called the punctal ectropion. So usually you see that in eyelids that are not uh, well uh, against the, the eyeball. And because it's not in, in the tear leak, it will not suck up the tears into your drainage system. <clears throat> now, we kept talking about ectropion. Um, usually, you need to be able to look for any problems in the eyelid. So, you're looking for eyelid laxity. There is no injury, but is it functioning well? Because if it slacks, then you have a failure of the lacrimal pump. The most common cause would be age or involution. It age-related. The patient just got very old. Or cicatricial, meaning you, can, you, you probably will have uh, contractions in the area. <clears throat> it could be because of an injury. It could be because of an illness. It could have been a congenital problem or because of a, sev um, of a facial nerve palsy problem. Now, how do you confirm problems uh, when you're suspecting eyelid laxity? You do a snapback or a forward distraction test. Now, a snapback is you pulling down the lower lid. And then re when you release the lower lid, <clears throat> you count the seconds on how, how long it takes for the eyelid to go back to its primary position. So you're counting the, the seconds and sometimes the patient would um, need to blink before it returns to its position. So when do you ask for the patients to blink? After they've reached or get, got past 5 seconds and it's still just not returning, ask the patient to blink and sometimes it returns after that. If, if it doesn't return, it's a grade 4. So here's our grading system. Grade 0 means it returns immediately, there is no problem. Grade 1 would be 2 to 3 seconds before it came back. Grade 2 would require 4 to 5 seconds and grade 3 would become more than five seconds and then you're now asking the patient to blink and only then does it return or some patients even if you do that it does not return that is a grade four in the snapback test so this is how it looks you pull uh, you ask the patient to look straight pull down the lower lid and then when you release it, start counting. You can either use a, uh, a stopwatch or sometimes you can just do 1001, 1002, 1003. It will give you a faster, big, uh, a, a faster reflex time because you're actually looking at your patient and not at a stopwatch. And then you look how fast the eyelid returns. In this case, the eyelid did not return immediately and... Uh, if, you re uh, if it reaches 5 seconds and it does not yet return, ask the patient to blink. If it returns, it's a grade four. Uh, it's a grade 3. If it did not return, it's a grade 4. You could also do a forward distraction test. Now, you're pulling forward the center of the lower lid. Now, you're not pulling it downward. You're pulling it forward. You're pulling it towards you. Okay, so the snapback is you're pulling it downwards. The forward distraction test is you're pulling it towards you, pulling it forward. Now, measure how far away from the eye the, uh, the, eye, the eyelid was able to go. So, pull on the eyelid. If it's 7 millimeters or more, it's abnormal. 6 millimeters, it's still acceptable. So, just pull forward the eyelids and then measure it. You could use a caliper or, or a... Um, uh, a better um, uh, ruler and if it's more than seven millimeters you're look uh, you're looking at the eyelid margin <clears throat> if it's uh, more than seven millimeters it's abnormal it's not supposed to go out to go out that far now 
you also need to press on the lacrimal sac, especially if you notice a, a bulge in that area, and check if you push on that area, on the lacrimal sac area, do you see a backflow of tears? Now, be warned if you if you notice discharge instead of just liquid. If you see mucoid or purulent discharge, then you have an inflamed lacrimal sac or signs of inflammation. So remember the signs of inflammation, the redness, the swelling, the, the, the pain uh, in the area. So if you see any of these signs, the patient's lacrimal sac is infected and probably everything inside the lacrimal drainage area would also be infected. Now there are some special tests that you can do. This is not just a basically observing the patient. You can also do some special tests to confirm some suspicions that you may have. One is the corneal test. You're testing for corneal hyperstesia or hyposthesia, which is a reduced sensitivity. So hyperstesia, painful, uh, very sensitive cornea, hyposthesia, reduced sensitivity. Now, usually you do this test for reduced sensitivity and um, in, uh, in, in it's done in, with severe and chronic dry eye diseases. You can use a wisp of cotton. Some use a fancy instrument, but a wisp of cotton, which is hand, always available in every clinic. That means a wisp. That means pull the cotton apart. Don't use an entire a ball of cotton just pull uh, pull a small um, a, a few strands of the cotton and run it across the patient's cornea usually they will feel it you can feel your cornea is very sensitive you can feel even if there's a single eyelash that went out of uh, uh, out of position so patient should be able to to uh, to notice this but if the patient says no, I did not feel anything, then you say, then you can see that the cornea, the cornea is actually uh, desensitized. Now, usually you do this when you're suspecting severe and chronic dry eyes. Okay, so how does uh, a numb cornea contribute to dry eyes? If your cornea is numb, then your your eyes, your glands are not getting a feedback that uh, that the eyes are dry because usually when the eyes dry up your um, <clears throat> your lacrimal gland gets the signal that the eyes are dry so give us more tears so if the cornea is not sending any uh, indication any help um, uh, message then the gland doesn't produce uh, or doesn't release the uh, the tears Something that's very easy to do, the tear breakup time or the T-bot. Usually people just call this, call this T-bot. So it's an indication of term, uh, tear film stability. That means it's not, it's not specific. You don't know if it's the mucin layer, the aqueous layer, or the lipid layer that's, imp that, uh, that's problematic. But you know the tear film is unstable. Usually it's done with the combination of a fluorescein strip, which is a piece of paper with fluorescein infusion on the tip, and cobalt blue light of a slit lamp. If you don't have a slit lamp, you can also use the cobalt blue light, the bl that's the blue light in your ophthalmoscope. So <clears throat> you do this by rubbing the fluorescein strip across the eyelids, the inner part of the eyelids, and you ask the patient to blink a few times to distribute the fluorescein. So it's a biologic dye. It will not permanently stain the eye, but it's colored yellow and under blue light, it will glow into a, a, a yellow green light, uh, liquid. Okay, so ask the patient blink to spread the, the liquid and ask the patient to keep their eyes open. If the patient has a hard time trying to keep their eyes open because their their problems are very very, uh, they have a very severe dry eyes and um, they have problems trying to keep the eyes open for a long time, you can help the eyes open by holding the eyelids, but do not press it against the eyeball, press it against the bones. So ask the patient, keep your eyes open, and then from the time of the last blink, you start counting the seconds until you see the first dry spot. Since the liquid itself glows, 
you will know if an area of the eye suddenly became dry, suddenly showed dryness, normally it should be more than 10 seconds. So if you're counting up to 10, and before you reach the number 10, you now see spots of dryness in your patient's eye, then that's abnormal. You can say that's an abnormal T-bot. You could also do Schirmer's tests, which uses strips of Wattman filter paper, and you measure the amount of tears in five minutes. So after five minutes, you remove the, the paper and then you start measuring. You fold the tip of the paper and place it on, uh, in the eyelids. The, uh, the outer edge, I show you later on how it's done. The outer part is outside of the eyelids. The tip of the, um, uh, <clears throat> the Schirmer paper will be inside of the eyelids. It's usually placed in the middle one-third of the lower lid and you ask the patient to look straight and avoid blinking for five minutes. And now, when the five minutes is up, you measure from the fold to the edge of the wet part. That will give you the results of the shermer. So you place the tip of the shermer's um, strip uh, on your patient's eye um, between the lateral third and the middle third and just ask them to avoid blinking. Look, just look straight and you're waiting until five minutes and then you remove um, both of the uh, Schirmer's paper. Now, if you notice, there's an, the area of wet air, the wet area of the strips is indicated by the arrows you measure from the fold, which is uh, located at the very edge of your eyelids, and the edge of the uh, the wet the the, uh, the tip of the wet part. So that will show you the results, and you interpret it <coughs> as having an abnormal result if it's less than ten millimeters. So the patient should have more than that. Now there are several types of shimmers. Uh, you have Schirmer 1, which is done without anesthesia. Uh, it's not that painful, so don't worry. So it measures basic tearing. <coughs> uh, Schirmers with no anesthesia, uh, that, me um, that means uh, you did not put any anesthesia. So the patient um, would have um, the, both the basal and the reflex tearing because the uh, since you did not put anesthesia, the eye can feel that there's a paper there and it will try to flush it. And Schirmer's 2 would have no anesthesia also, but you stimulate the nose, which is basically a measurement of the reflex steering. So it's useful for severe aqueous deficiency, but if your problem, if your patient's problem is just a mild dry eyes, this is not that dependable. There have been criticisms that the Schirmer's tests are not reproducible. They're not that accurate. So, um, but it's used very well in severe aqueous deficiency patients. So don't use this in all of your patients, especially if your patient are just saying that they have mild dry eyes. If they start seeing other patients sitting in your clinic with pieces of paper sticking in your eye, you will scare your patients away. Now probing is putting a blunt instrument through the punctum and canaliculus. These are very, very small, very, very fine uh, instruments. They're usually met metallic with blunt edges and you're using it to determine if the, the canaliculus is Patent. So it's your upper lacrimal drainage system. You're, you're, you can only probe all the way up to the common canaliculus. Now, your goal is to hit the bony surface of the lacrimal sac fossa. That means you've successfully entered the, the punctum. You've successfully managed to go into the, canalicul uh, the canaliculi and the common canaliculi, and you have now entered the lacrimal sac. So if you st start noticing that you're already heating bone, you can feel it in your uh, by how your, your probe feels. That means everything is intact, at least in the upper lacrimal drainage area. Now, <clears throat> if you notice that there is an obstruction, it's actually prudent not 
to force the issue, just say that you cannot go through within, let's say, 5 millimeters, 10 millimeters of the punctum. <clears throat> Don't push it. Sometimes um, it may be patent, but if you uh, if it's not patent, you might destroy the canaliculus. So if you don't want, uh, <clears throat> um, if you you could also do a lacrimal apparatus irrigation or an LAI, it mean it means you're going to flush saline solution through the punctum and canaliculus. Usually you do this with a syringe, with a needle, with a blunt edge. So it's either a needle designed entirely for a lacrimal apparatus irrigation, or in cases wherein you don't have that type of needle. You can get a regular needle, break off the tip, and then just make sure there are no sharp edges. Now you can put this through the uh, through the punctum and the canaliculi and try to flush uh, the fluids there. Normal, the patient should say, I feel water flowing in our nose. Remember when you cry, uh, even your nose cries and you can feel that uh, there's fluid in your nose when you cry. That's the same uh, feeling that your patient with a normal LAI result would have. They will feel fluid in the nasopharynx. An abnormal would cause a fluid reflux. Okay, so how, how do you work about it? If it's a <clears throat> canalicular obstruction, you're, you're, you're flushing through the punctum and the canaliculus and the obstruction is in the canaliculus, then the reflux would be in the same punctum. So you do have a reflux, but it's coming out from where you entered. If it's only a partial or a, a partial influx, that means you will uh, a partial uh, obstruction, then you would your patient would say, I have some water in my nose, but you're getting also reflux outside. So that's a partial obstruction. And a complete obstruction that is uh, outside of the canaliculus, it could be in the com uh, common canaliculi or it could be in the nasolacrimal area or in the sac, then your reflex would be on the opposite punctum. Usually we use the lower punctum, but you could have the reflex in the superior or the superior punctum if the, the, uh, if the blockage is either in the common canaliculus, uh, the nasolacrimal duct, or the sac. Okay, again, remember your anatomy. It's very, very useful and it will actually give you clues on what your findings mean. So the, 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 one, the pictures on top, A and B, is actually a probe that's being placed inside the, uh, the punctum. One, it's going to dilate the punctum. So if it's stenosed or if, it's, uh, if the canaliculus is very narrow, it will dilate it and it becomes wider, better drainage. And pictures C and D is a lacrimal irrigation needle being um, um, being fl with water being flushed into the system. Another exam is called the dye disappearance test. It uh, establishes the adequacy of the lacrimal drainage. You give your patients topical anesthesia and you drop fluorescein dye into the fornix of both eyes. Okay, so the fornix is the uh, the uh, the col um, cul-de-sac uh, in both eyes. Then after five minutes, you look at the dye in the patient's tear meniscus and you need, you're looking for an asymmetric clearance which shows a relative block. What's an asymmetric clearance? One eye would have much more dye than the other dye, than the other, sorry, than the other eye. <clears throat> so that eye with the least number of uh, dye would be the normal eye and the one with the highest or the, low, uh, the most number of dye would have the relative blockage. So this is how it would look. You, the orange is basically the dye that spilled out of the eye, but you're looking at the eyeball and you're looking at that thin line of yellow at the, uh, where, uh, where the eyeball is meeting the, uh, the eyelids. It's called the tear meniscus. So you're comparing the number of the amount of dye in this eye with the other eye, with the eye having the most number of remaining dye 
being the problematic eye. <clears throat> okay, so you could also have uh, the Jones ex Jones uh, test. You have two of them. You uh, with using the dye disappearance test that we showed you earlier. Uh, you can now get a pledget and put it in the inferior meatus. Okay, so when you do that, you're now checking if there is dye in the pledget. So either you're looking for that yellow or you use the blue light, shine it on your pledget. If there is any fluorescein in that pledget, then it will glow yellow green. Um, dye in the pledget means there's patent drainage. If there's no dye, there is an obstruction. So it's really good if you do this test on the, uh, on the eye that showed you the relative block or uh, the most number of fluids left in the eye. Now, Jones 2 is uh, checking for the dye plus irrigation. That means you, uh, you irrigate the eye, you do an LAI, you flush basically what's inside, and again, you put a, uh, a pledget, a cotton pledget at the inferior meatus, and if there is a dye, that means uh, there is no obstruction. It's just that the lacrimal pump is not working. It's uh, it's patent. That means fluid is getting inside the eye and it could go out, but the eye, uh, the lacrimal pump is not pushing it forward. If there is no dye, then it's called a true mechanical obstruction. There is something that is really uh, obstructing the area. So it, that uh, you're using the dye, plus you will... Uh, sh uh, we will use the LAI, the lacrimal uh, apparatus irrigation, to check if fluid does come out of the end of the nose. You could also go for meniscometry, which is basically just a measurement of the height of the tear meniscus. It's an estimate of the tear volume. So if you have less than 0.25 millimeters, it's equivalent to dry ice. So this is the tear meniscus. It's, you look for it at where your eyelid, the, the edge of your eyelid, is meeting the eyeball. You will see a small lake of fluid there. There, there will be, it's going to be like a dam of uh, clear liquid. It's called the tear meniscus. And then that's what you measure. If it's 0.25 uh, or below, it's dry ice. It should be more. So how do you manage cases like this? Now, cases like this are actually easy, easily managed as long as you understand where the problems are, whether you can treat it with simple medications, with simple exercises, or do you need to do surgery. So the principle of the management is address the underlying cause. That's basically it. If you see an eyelid malposition or mild rotation, usually you will need to do surgery because there is already a permanent problem in the eye. Sometimes the um, the muscles are, prob are problematic, sometimes at the tendons, and you will probably need to do horizontal tightening. If it's just aberrant or misdirected lashes, then epilation, meaning pulling out those lashes, would uh, suffice. That's very easily done. Um, you could get a small forcep, the finest forcep that you have, and pull out those lashes that are either scratching the cornea or directed in towards the eyeball. If it's already recurrent, it just keeps coming back, then you can probably do surgery to, cre uh, to permanently uh, solve the problem. Sometimes you may, um, you, you could become, uh, you, you could just reposition the uh, the lead margin, or sometimes cautery would suffice. Now, if there's a foreign body in the cornea, then you need to remove it under topical anesthesia. Patient usually will have tried removing it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it does not, and sometimes it made it worse. So if they have a foreign body in the cornea, usually the patients know that opening their eye in water, flushing it with water, or sometimes they resort to... Um, TikTok solutions or f uh, um, Facebook solutions like getting hair and uh, running the hair across their eye or use uh, getting a piece of paper and running it across the eye or pieces of cloth. Sometimes it works, 
but most of the time it just makes it worse it just drives the foreign body deeper into the cornea you can easily remove this under topical anesthesia and as long as it's, it has not penetrated into the cornea it has not penetrated the uh, the cornea in uh, all the way to the endothelial side then usually the patient's problems resolves within a few days you also need to look for conjunctivitis especially blepharitis which could be treated by steroids or antibiotics the problem with blepharitis is people don't usually look at the eyelashes when they have a patient complaining they look at the eyeball they look at the eyelids and usually they don't really examine the eyelashes very well and most of the time uh, when you cannot find anything it's because it's in the lashes you could treat it with uh, steroids or antibiotics or sometimes just cleaning the lashes would suffice especially if you're dealing with mites like demodex demodex will not respond to antibiotics because it's not a bacteria usually will you will need something um, more um, <clears throat> Um, more than antibiotics like tea tree oil and if you have a, a nasolacrimal duct obstruction that means the obstruction is well deep into the drainage system not just the punctum not just the canaliculi then you will probably need to do DCR or dacryocystorhinostomy which is a surgery that involves trying to connect your uh, trying sorry trying to bypass the blockage by connecting the lacrimal sac into uh, your nasal mucosa so this is how you sh it's usually done you look at the uh, you uh, the, you incise the skin you're looking uh, for the lacrimal sac and then you open it and you go through the bone remember it's uh, resting on the lacrimal sac fossa you go through the bone you open um, <clears throat> you you need to drill through the bone and uh, open create a fistula from the lacrimal sac into your patient's nasal mucosa okay so sometimes you put you leave a tubing inside so it doesn't close on its own and then you can remove the tubing later on once everything has healed so the patient uh, will not use your its uh, their nasal lacrimal duct anymore they will bypass it from the lacrimal sac everything goes back through the nose so unless your patient is really crying a lot they don't really get flooded with tears remember your tears are mostly just basal secretion and a very very few often um, inconsequential reflex tearing but there are also a lot of non-surgical management for example you have artificial tears which is what usually is given to patients uh, who have dry eyes who have or have are showing mild cases of uh, dr uh, dry eyes um, you can also use punctal plugs if the problem is your your patient's um, eyes are very dry it's because their uh, their lacrimal drainage system is very very efficient and you want to delay the uh, the removal of the tears you want the tears to stay longer in the eye then you can plug um, the the punctum usually those are silicone plugs or you give them goggles that they can wear so their eyes don't dry up so you're trying to avoid with the goggles you're trying to avoid uh, exposure evaporation you can put warm compress on the eye not because it's a a hack it's because the warm uh, the warm compress will um, try, uh, will usually dissolve uh, the um, the lipid uh, the lipid that is um, stuck inside your meibomian glands sometimes you will see the meibomian glands with very very thick uh, oil there and warm compresses could dissolve this oil and get your uh, lipid layer back uh, into your tears if your problem is infections or sometimes just um, debris on the patient's eyelashes then eyelash and eyelid scrubbing will work now usually we avoid asking the patients to use um, Johnson's uh, baby shampoo or any brand of baby shampoo because although they're work uh, they're effective they also have a complication that dries up the eyes 
There are some prescription medications that could also be used. Uh, Restasis, uh, Sequa, and Sidra could also be used, but I believe in the Philippines only Restasis is available. Usually, it's used to, stim uh, to stimulate the eye to create more tears. We could also give topical uh, ophthalmic steroids, especially if there's an inflammation uh, in the area that's causing a problem either in the drainage or in the production of your, of your tears. Um, taking oral flaxseed or fish oil supplements, usually at 2,000 milligrams per day can help. The logic with this is you're trying to change the lipid composition of your patient's uh, um, lipid profile such that um, the meibomian glands which became blocked uh, by the oil should have a uh, a different composition of the meibomian, uh, the lipids in the meibomian glands and hoping that the addition of um, fish oil or flaxseed which is converted to omega-3 would create a better flow in the, your meibomian glands. Also, uh, autologous serum tears are used uh, and there are some machines that are being uh, marketed out there that would, that should help. Uh, there's tear care and lipid flow. Tear care, uh, basically, it's a automated uh, meibomian gland heating. Lipid flow also creates the same thing and also some manual expression, meaning it massages the area, uh, creates a flow of your meibomian glands. Now, this too should work, especially if your problem is with your meibomian glands, with your lipid layer. If it, if your problem is with a, um, if your problem is if there's a, uh, a drainage problem, a drainage obstruction, this will not work, obviously. If there's a problem in your lacrimal gland, this also will not work, again, obviously. Or if there is a problem, uh, organic problem in your con conjunctiva, in your cornea, or in your eyelids, <clears throat> like a lax eyelid, obviously, this will also not work. And um, there are some studies showing that intense pulsed light therapy should help. Again, it's taking care of the meibomian gland system, which is basically problems with the lipid layer of your tears. So that will be all for today. Um, thank you. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to share them in the comments below. Thank you.